It's been two years now since I moved out of my parents' home. It's telling that I now call it my parents' home, but calling it that is still awkward. I fully expect to move again in the near future, so I only experience true grounding on the days that I visit my parents, have a meal cooked for me, and maybe even sleep in my old room. It's unsettling that it no longer feels like my room. It may not have changed, but I have. More worryingly, in such a period of flux, I don't have the clarity of knowing exactly who I've become over that time. Returning home is a wonderful, nostalgic feeling. It's great to feel cared for and settle back into an old routine, but it's impossible for me to become who I was two years ago. That's what resonates with me the most about Sleeping Dog's first hour. Wei Shen is a Hong Kong American, returning to his homeland for the first time in years. The game opens to a chase sequence where he's arrested, only to reveal that he's an undercover cop. It's a clever narrative gotcha to say, hey look how good he is undercover, even you didn't know. Unless you read the marketing material. The arrest is a ploy to get Wei in contact with Jackie Ma, a childhood friend and low-ranking member in one of Hong Kong's biggest triads, the sort of fictional Sun On Yi based on a definitely not fictional Sun Yi On. Thank goodness crime syndicates don't have trademarks. This is Wei! Wei Shen? I told you about him, remember? Fuck! We can't keep track of your bullshit friends, Jackie! No outsider! He's not an outsider, he's from old prosperity! Like us, Ho Chi all day, Jama! Wei's old school, you know? I grew up with the guy. Wei is tasked with ascending the ranks and bringing down the head honchos, so of course you can expect a devoted love letter to Hong Kong action cinema. Giving him a childhood connection changes things a little. It makes it clear that Sleeping Dogs isn't just about the city or the triads, it's about Wei himself. The loose premise is that of an undercover cop film, you know how this goes, you're a loose cannon but you get the job done. Except Wei has got baggage. Triad members caused his sister's descent into prostitution and drug use, particularly Dog Eyes, resident dickhead who's encroaching on the territory of Winston Chu. Wei plants himself as a solution to Winston's problem to ascend the ranks, all while harboring a very public grudge against his target. Hey, who's the new blood? It's Wei. You remember Mimi Shen? Back when you first started getting girls with Big Smiley. Oh, Mimi. Oh, yeah. First girl ever sucked my cock. <laughs> Except it's made quickly apparent that bringing down Dog Eyes won't truly satisfy Wei. Dog Eyes may have got his sister hooked, but she didn't die in Hong Kong. Periodic police reports on Wei's phone reveal that she was given a deadly dose in America nearly two decades later, and the San Francisco police may have covered up an incident where Wei murdered the offending drug dealer. His return to Hong Kong wasn't just because the HKPD needed an expert for their undercover work, it may well have been a chance to keep him out of the spotlight. What's telling is that there's never a moment in the game where Wei declares exactly why he chose to take on this undercover operation. It's later made evident that Dog Eyes isn't the only link in this chain, and taking down the deep set rings of prostitution and drug dealing isn't as simple as bringing down one man. Despite this, Wei gradually earns the trust of Winston and his Water Street gang. Gameplay is split between a near equal number of triad missions and cop missions, and at pretty much any moment, Wei has one of each available. This means that assisting fellow triad members might be followed up by getting one of their ranks arrested. This structure neatly demonstrates how risky Wei's attempt to balance two lifestyles really is. When one of his arrests nearly brings his death at the hands of Winston, it drives this sense of paranoia, but it also creates this really nice ludic environment to convey Wei's personal struggle. Keep in mind the Water Street gang is composed of childhood friends, and because he's only returned to bring them down, becoming attached again gives him an identity crisis. Progression is marked by three systems, triad points, cop points, and face. I'll leave the face system for now because I want to discuss it later, but the distinction between the other two is ingenious. They have separate skill trees but are not exclusive to their respective mission type, and they reward you for different reasons. Triad points fit the predictable action game reward structure. Points are earned for cool environmental kills, hijacking enemy vehicles, countering incoming punches, you get the idea. Cop points are a little different. Missions begin on a full police meter, and points are subtracted for poor conduct. 
harming civilians, causing property damage, that kind of thing. Admittedly, this makes it almost impossible to get the maximum points for a mission, because running over one stray bit of fencing in this densely packed city will immediately punish you. But that's sort of the point, isn't it? It's difficult to follow police conduct without blowing your cover, and working through protocol is just as frustrating for Wei as it is for the player. It's much more subtle than just kicking you to a fail state screen, and this method implies that Wei's behaviour is tolerated due to his good results, but not exactly appreciated. During the hustle and bustle of daily life, he remains cool and collected, your typical action game protagonist. But when the game prompts you to get some sleep, that image begins to unravel. Wei's dingy flat is infested with cockroaches, and there's a screaming baby next door. And because he keeps a photo of his deceased sister and mother by his bed, you're reminded of how lonely he has become. Sleep brings a flurry of dialogue from the previous days, demonstrating how haunted he feels in an admittedly very on-the-nose fashion. That said, there are other, more subtle ways that this is communicated, like when he wakes up trying to calm himself down, and the game flashes up reminders of the contradictory cop and triad missions that he's yet to do. These small palate cleansing breaks demonstrate just how much Wei's outward facing personality acts as a mask for his crisis. Sleeping Dogs is eager to show that Wei can fulfil the role of a competent protagonist without being completely invulnerable. There are a number of dating missions where he flits between girls similar to Grand Theft Auto 4. During these, Wei is the friendly, cool, and honestly pretty attractive person that we'd all like to see ourselves as, and he's practically swimming in women. It's the type of romantic fantasy that GTA-style games are known for. The first of these girls is Amanda, an American tourist who seems to click with Wei. However, because the police had to do a background check on her, a report sent to Wei's phone reveals that she's been shopping around, likely with a fetish for Asian men, and Wei was essentially objectified without knowing it. Wei later discovers that one of his dates, Tiffany, is cheating on him. Using his police wiretap, he monitors a payphone she's using, follows her to her secret date, and confronts them in the act. Honestly, I fully expected to fight a band of goons for the mission and call it a day, but the man she's with finds out you're a triad gangster and nopes out of there, bringing the attention squarely back to Tiffany. At this point, you might be expecting Karma to strike her, but instead the conversation is turned back on Wei. She found out that Wei was dating other girls at the same time, and when he can't promise to dump the others, she leaves him. Okay, okay, but I'm sorry, alright? I never meant for you to get hurt. Huh, some excuse. So you're gonna dump her now? Stay loyal to me? Or do I have to go find another man to keep you warm? Let me see what I can do. You know, I thought you were different. I guess not. Goodbye. These dates aren't meant to be just an escape for the player, they're an exploration of Wei's negative traits. Upon arriving in Hong Kong, he has no family left, and no friends either. He only earns the trust of the triad members to stab them in the back later on. So is it any wonder that he has commitment issues? The point of this sequence is to demonstrate that anybody, whether it's Wei or the girls he's dating, can have understandable flaws that don't necessarily excuse their behaviour. The real kick in the teeth comes with the following police report. A background check revealed that many of her other dates were triad members that the police were pursuing. The report then says, This officer recommends that the subject be approached to act as a criminal investigator. For leverage, detectives should use her overlapping sexual relationships, as disclosure of these would almost certainly put her in personal peril. Often, it feels like there are no winners in this story. The Undercover Cop In Too Deep isn't exactly a brand spanking new premise, but the game's strength is in its believability. The Sun on Yi members aren't dick dastardly, Jackie genuinely believes Wei is his friend, and it becomes clear just how eager he is to be approved by Winston and make a name for himself. Winston is portrayed as the not-so-smart, easily convinced leader, Wei says as much in one of his police reports. However, one of Winston's better traits is his loyalty. When your business is run from the back of your mum's kitchen, it probably shouldn't be surprising that he values friendship and loyalty, so once he starts to trust Wei, he begins to open up. Winston may be a criminal and a thug, 
but he cares for his men. As Dog Eyes invades his territory, most of his violence is retaliatory. He is by no means one of the good guys, but he genuinely seems like somebody who's carved out his own life growing up as a Triad member. The police are an equally mixed bag. Raymond. Shed. Finally. Raymond is Wei's handler, and through several periodic meetings, he shows that he doesn't believe Wei is emotionally stable enough for the job. This also demonstrates just how much weight is pulled by Pendrew, the superintendent of the HKPD. Pendrew calls him Wei, to contrast Raymond's Mr. Shen. Pendrew believes that Wei's means are justified by the ends. Despite this support, the only person Wei really gets along with in the force is Inspector Teng, who is initially relieved that Wei is not like Pendrew. I'm already out there on the streets, I hear things like this ketamine racket. I'll see what I can dig up. How's that for an olive branch? Serious. Just like that. Look, I'll help where I can. <laughs> what? I'm just a little shocked. I'm just used to Pendrew's people being more like him. The police force is just as nuanced and complicated as the Sun on Yi. Both groups feature opposing forces with different views, and ironically, Wei has to earn the approval of his police force superiors much the same way he has to with the Water Street Gang. Wei's story is an identity crisis, one where returning to his homeland doesn't immediately give him answers. With the requirement to maintain this false identity as cover, Wei's left on his own, struggling with two different lifestyles that he can't properly balance, with no clear sense of who he should be. This makes Hong Kong the perfect choice of setting. To understand where I'm coming from, all you really need to do is look at how it's classified in the first sentence of its Wikipedia page. Hong Kong, officially the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China, is a metropolitan area and special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. The page later describes it as a city, but the wording is very careful for a reason. Speaking of careful... Alright, so... As a Scot and a Brit making a gaming video, I'm obviously not the most qualified to be talking about this. What I've done is some general research in order to discuss the game, so I highly recommend referring to backed up studies or information from Hong Kongers if you're interested in delving into this topic. I'm about to discuss one of the most controversial modern political debates in a video about a video game. Sources I've used will be included in the description as always. In the 19th century, Hong Kong was uh, acquired by Britain as a result of the Opium Wars. Considering it was surrounded by Chinese territory, the British Empire wanted to ensure its security, and later drafted an agreement where China would lease Hong Kong to the British for 99 years. 99-year leases were an historic practice which implied indefinite ownership without actually specifying it. In classic British fashion, a practice dating back to the Middle Ages was still being used because, meh, that's what we've always done. Over this period, Hong Kong culture began to coincide with some British culture, reflected in its architecture, and the popularity of Western pop music. By the 20th century, the now communist China began to appreciate Hong Kong as a capitalist cousin with the elite conduct business internationally. As the lease deadline grew nearer, Britain hoped China would extend it, but Hong Kong's value to the nation led them to request it be handed back over. In 1997, Hong Kong was returned to China, but under some unique terms. Hong Kongers had grown used to the capitalist culture of the West, and were afraid of the nation changing significantly under communist jurisdiction, not least due to the relatively recent, okay, time to get this video banned in China, Tiananmen Square Massacre. As you may be aware, the one country, two systems principle, agreed to run until 2047, is currently in a strange sense of flux. On the 30th of June 2020, a new security law made subversion of the central government illegal, and it also decreed that Beijing would have power over the law's interpretation in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has a complicated society, one which is still grappling with its own identity. Hong Konger, Chinese, mixed identity, Setting's waste story of identity in a region where its residents now more than ever consider themselves Hong Kongers in a region that's rapidly becoming homogenous with China is a choice that has become even more poignant with time. The cultural impact of the West on Hong Kong can't be understated, and it seems developer United Front Games were well aware of that, 
Streets are illuminated by neon signs written in both English and Cantonese. Traditional Chinese music plays on one station, while British rock with an English host blares on another. There's even cultural differences across generations. Winston and the Water Street Gang primarily use English, keep in mind that the game targeted a Western audience, but they use Cantonese for emphasis or for certain colloquial phrases. The younger generations in the game may be deeply influenced by globalization and Western media, but they still show their Cantonese heritage through their slang. Now he's working for dog eyes! Dead harm Garton is getting back at us for taking his minibus route! Wei, on the other hand, hasn't lived in Hong Kong since he was a kid, so while he very likely knows Cantonese, he only speaks in English. While almost everyone understands him, there's a clear divide within the triad. Wei is an outsider. So I'm gonna sound like a right muppet shifting my patter into Glesga chat, especially when it's actual mints. But you can see that it creates this pure divide between me and yourself. That's what the game's day in between Wei and his triad mates. <laughs> Nowhere is this effect more pronounced than with Winston's mum, Mrs Chu, who only speaks in Cantonese. There are a handful of conversations between her and Wei, and while they can understand each other, the awkwardness of these scenes suggests it's not very well. While Wei has a deep connection to his homeland, he doesn't seem to have a clear idea of what those links are. As a result, Sleeping Dogs acts as an exploration of Hong Kong culture, from martial arts to karaoke bars. So I told that pop guy not to mess with me, and he said, wait, who's singing that? Oh no. Okay, here's your spoiler warning and also an appeal from me. Sleeping Dogs is deceptive. On first inspection, it looks like any other Grand Theft Auto style romp, but it's really a game that manages to expertly dodge all the typical narrative trappings of GTA, beyond just justifying it as undercover work. To fully explore that, I highly recommend playing the game first, and then returning here. Alright, time for spoiler territory. As the feud between Winston and Dog Eyes escalates, the violence ups in intensity. This spat draws the attention of the higher ups in the Sun On Yi, namely the Dragon Head Uncle Po, who summons Winston to, you know, have a chat. Visibly nervous, he invites Wei to go with him. This turns out to be a fortunate choice because Uncle Po takes a liking to Wei's loyalty. The triads of Hong Kong historically maintain a Blood Brother style oath, and this is portrayed through the Sun On Yi under Uncle Po. He emphasizes the importance of family, and how the infighting of Winston and Dog Eyes is detrimental to that. Uncle Po brings further focus to the game's wider theme of family, especially when you consider that Wei no longer has any blood relatives to confide in. It's particularly ironic considering Wei is a cop, hence the least reliable of them all. Poe's focus on family becomes vital as the conflict escalates further. Gun control is very strict in Hong Kong, and that's why crimes with blunt weapons and blades are far more common. That's how the meat cleaver became so synonymous with Hong Kong crime. Sleeping Dog's first half is dominated by hand-to-hand -hand combat, ignoring some silly DLC content that undermines this completely, and guns are only brought into the picture later, when Wei is given instruction from Pendru. I'm sure you've noticed that guns are something of a rarity in Hong Kong. in Hong Kong. Penju! What are you doing? I told you he wasn't important. Now he is. He's going to help us nail Charlie Pang. Guns become more common as Wei confronts the wealthy upper echelons of the triad. Once Wei proves himself to the Water Street gang, Winston begins to consider him a friend, showing the same care as he would any other member of his gang. He trusts Wei with helping his girlfriend organize the final parts of their upcoming wedding. Peggy is not a triad gangster. In fact, she's far calmer than Winston, has a more intimate understanding of emotions, and it's clear from what she says that they have a loving bond. She even manages to get Wei to open up and start to reconcile with his troubled past in the course of one day. Hang on. What are you doing? The, the, guy, the guy had the wrong address. Winston asked me to make sure the cake is delivered. He's so thoughtful. Wei, slow down! 
Peggy, if we don't catch that van, you won't have your special cake at your wedding. What? Master, master, go back! Peggy acts as a nice change from the bravado that many of the triad members show. So of course, it's inevitable that she dies. You're gonna tell me that the love interest of one of the main characters is introduced just after guns are, and she's not gonna be shot to progress the narrative? Right. Despite being so obvious that you could see it coming from Taiwan, they still manage to turn it into an interesting twist. The day of the wedding is jovial. Many members of the Sun On Yi are present, including Uncle Po himself. Uncle Po! Welcome! My guest of honor! I'm happy to be here. It's nice to see someone who wants to be a good family man. Not enough of that nowadays. That's until attackers gun down the wedding, critically injuring Poe and killing Peggy. What's particularly interesting is that Winston also dies during the attack. Peggy's death isn't just an excuse for Winston to go off the deep end, escalate the fight with Dog Eyes, and hence cause a confrontation with Wei. No, this goes deeper. Shut up, both of you! Winston's gone. Right now, we gotta stick together. We just can't let the 18K get away with this. What makes you so sure it was 18K? We all saw them. They were definitely 18K. Even stupid Jackie knows that. You ever think maybe they were just trying to look like 18K? Look, we've had a few skirmishes with them lately. Nothing major. It doesn't make sense that they would do something this big. Oh, man. Oh, so, so, so who do you think it was? I don't know. But I'm gonna find out. <clears throat> and who the fuck are you? I'm here for Mr. Lee. I take it you've heard of Big Smile Lee. He's another Sun On Yi boss, Red Bull, just like Winston. Okay, what can we do for Mr. Lee? He has decided that for the time being, you may continue your operations in this area. But the percentage previously paid to Winston will now go to Mr. Lee. That's an interesting proposition. But I have a counteroffer for Mr. Lee. I'd appreciate if you relay this back to him word for word. Can you do that? You tell Mr. Lee that his people stay the fuck out of our territory, and in return, we'll let him live. I don't think he'll find that offer to his liking. I think you'll find that I don't give a fuck. You see our guest out, make sure he doesn't get lost. You'll regret this. I promise you that. Remember how I said that Dog Eyes wasn't the only link in the chain? The attack on the wedding and Uncle Poe's death was a chance for Big Smile Lee to take over the entire triad. Winston's death also left a power vacuum in North Point. Except for one thing. Do you have any family here at all? Uh, no, not anymore. Well, you're wrong, Wei. You have family, you have us. <laughs> Peggy, do you have any Winston's clothes in the back? I don't think these rubs gonna make the right impression. What do you think about this? Yeah, sure. Winston's golden gun is introduced before he organizes the first proper attack on Dog Eye's operation, and immediately following the wedding, Wei's wielding the same weapon in the same place. The brilliant, nuanced detail here is that Wei isn't in too deep because he sympathizes with the triad members, but because he's become one of them, and it's more than just talk. While the wedding could be considered the turning point of the story, Wei's turning point is entering Mrs. Chu's kitchen and disabling the bug he placed in the vent. Without any words, this moment demonstrates just how emotionally involved he has become. Your job was to get close to Winston. Now that's not much of a strategy anymore. Get close to? Open your eyes, Raymond. I am Winston now. With him gone, I'll be taking his place. You want the chairman? I report to him now. You want the Red Poles? I'm one of them. That's what worries me, Wei. You're one of them. Big Smile Lee is the antithesis to Wei. By operating a drug ring to bring teenage girls into prostitution and pornography, Lee is the reason why people like Wei's sister get pulled into that lifestyle. Dog Eyes, though a complete scumbag, is just following Lee's lead. Over the years, Lee has expanded his operations, even digging his roots into above-board entertainment, film, and music. With these funds, he can afford more forces, with the kind of firepower that Wei's Water Street gang can't hold a candle to. This is where Broken Nose Zhang enters the picture. The second half of the story gives much more prominence to its female cast. Inspector Teng has continued involvement, but Peggy acts as the game-changer, showing how a civilian can live peacefully among the triads. Then 
needs brothers, uncles, sisters too. To help me with that soft side. Don't laugh, it's very important. After the wedding, Wei assists Mrs. Chu in her revenge against Dog Eyes, and she quickly becomes a terrifying force. With Big Smile Lee's attack on North Point, he makes it clear that he's willing to forego the triad tradition of brotherhood in order to consolidate power. Broken Nose Zhang is introduced as Lee's direct rival. Not only is it unusual for the organisation to have female members, the fact she's a Red Pole, one of the triad's lieutenants, is criticised by Lee. She despises Lee's abuse of women, believing the future of the Sun on Yi to be far away from sex worker industries. She also has her eyes on the coveted dragon head position, and enlists Wei's help. At this point, it's evident that the Winston Dog Eye struggle was always just a proxy war between Zhang and Lee, one that Wei's been dropped straight into. I must commend the attempt to portray this final stretch of the game as a moral battle, not just for Wei but the Sun on Yi triad itself. Whether Li or Zhang succeeds, significant change would be brought to the group. After the handover of real life Hong Kong in 97, stricter police crackdowns made it harder for triads to operate in the region, and the groups had to modify their business to survive. For example, triads formally inducted new members via an extensive ceremony in which their code of loyalty and brotherhood is instilled. However, these inductions attracted police attention, and over time they've been dropped almost entirely. It's just one example of how a code so essential to triads can no longer be enforced, and it shows how the groups are gradually becoming amorphous and indistinguishable from any other gang. Sleeping Dogs features a rather traditional depiction of triads rooted deep in the cultural perception built up through decades of media. Though it does point towards the homogenization of triads with other gangs via Lee's undermining of their moral code, it sadly doesn't even begin to approach the wider picture. Why exactly this is the case? Well, who's our backup? Now, who's looking out for us? <sighs> Fuck. No one ever looks out for you in this town. I don't know, man. Feels like the game has changed. It used to be a brotherhood. There was a code. Even amongst rival triads. Now we're killing each other at weddings. Even in a fucking hospital. And for what? That's because it regrettably chooses to avoid politics completely. A choice that seems counterintuitive when triads both currently and historically are deeply influenced by the region's politics. In real Hong Kong history, the role of triads drifted with the passage of time. The word triad was in fact a British blanket term for the region's secret societies, many of whom wished to overthrow the Manchu Qing dynasty that ruled from the 17th to 20th century, and re-establish the former Ming dynasty. Over the centuries, these groups splintered into sects that now claim conflicting origins. In the 20th century, the political landscape of Hong Kong changed significantly, and so too did the triads. They benefited greatly from international ties that the city offered, and their business thrived under capitalism. However, with the region's return to China, their role again began to shift. Once more, this delves into some general research. Sources will be in the description, and I highly recommend doing some research of your own into this. In 1984, then leader of China Deng Xiaoping stated that, quote, Hong Kong black societies are very powerful. They're even more powerful than their counterparts elsewhere. Of course, not all black societies are dark. There are many good guys among them. In a 1993 press conference four years before Hong Kong's handover, China's Minister of Public Security, Tao Siju, said that the patriotic triad members had a part in building the Chinese nation. This was part of his United Front strategy, in which he invited them to set up business on the mainland. Cases of the Chinese government cooperating with thugs for hire on the mainland to maintain order are not unprecedented. With the country's growing influence over Hong Kong, the triads now serve a similar function in that region. The 2014 umbrella movement of pro-democracy protests saw attacks from triad members that studies suggest were hired by the Chinese government. Curiously, many of these attackers were apparently brought in from out of town, and these attacks were supposedly met with pushback from the local triad members protecting their territory. This suggests that triad groups are facing a moral conflict, both internally and externally, over their changing setting. 
It's an interesting contrast to Operation Yellowbird, with the Sun Yi On and 14K Triads assisted Western intelligence in helping Tiananmen Square protesters escape to Hong Kong. Ultimately, it's hard to decipher the morals of these criminal groups, because like many others, they respond first and foremost to money. It's why I can understand Sleeping Dog's reluctance to dig deeper into this topic, because the way it portrays characters like Winston as sympathetic could be seen as sympathy for general triad causes. Considering the Umbrella Movement wouldn't occur for another two years after the game's release, they perhaps dodged a bullet by not getting too political. Despite this shortcoming of the narrative, the story still focuses on police corruption in Hong Kong, albeit through one character instead of tackling systemic corruption. Wei's ascension to Red Pole status marks a turning point for his superintendent. This should be all I need to put Sonny Wo away for a long time. And with Uncle Po dead- Wait, how'd you hear about that? Good news travels fast. Big Smiley will take over. It'll be even worse than it was under Poe. I can't come in now. I'm not finished yet. I understand your personal reasons for doing this, your history with the Sun On Yi. This is why I selected you. But you've done more than enough. Those are my orders. Fuck your orders and fuck you too, Penju. I came on to take down the Sun On Yi, not to shuffle the deck. Shen, you're making a mistake. Prior to this, it seemed that Raymond was Wei's greatest adversary in a force, but with Uncle Po out of the way, Pendrew begins to show his true colours. <laughs> what the fuck are the 18K doing here? They're here to make a show, or maybe to start a fight. All the Sun On Yi leaders are here in one place. I don't think they expected the police to be here, though. <laughs> Never been happy to see the cops before. Hey, where the fuck is Sonny? They're fucking arresting him! Let's go, boys. We got what we came for. We're leaving. Hey, you! You can't do this here. It's a fucking funeral. Goddamn police! Why don't you show some fucking respect, huh? Why don't you? The 18K are about to do this city a great public service. And anyone who stays here deserves everything they get. The cops are leaving? What the fuck? The 18K are going to- This is gonna get bloody. Come on. Shit, here they come, man! Show these motherfuckers what it means to be sent on ye! The morally grey manoeuvres of the police and hints of corruption finally come to light, revealing that they have the capacity to be just as morally bankrupt as the triads they're combating. Wei's identity struggle between triad and police is caused as much by his own personal stakes as it is the glaring similarities between the two groups. Just as Lee attacked his own triad in a takeover bid, Pendrew shows that he's willing to risk his colleagues for his own ends. Much as he did when he first brought in the loose cannon Wei to work undercover. Raymond, formerly Wei's greatest critic, actually goes behind Pendrew's back to offer a chance to bail out, which Wei flatly refuses. At this crucial moment, it's unclear just how much he still considers himself a police officer. Despite this, he maintains a certain level of professionalism that leaves his allegiances murky. He files police reports that are cold and practical, and he never makes a mistake that drops his cover. His professional side becomes a facade, tying directly into his use of confidence to hide his insecurities. There's another aspect of Wei that is portrayed pretty creatively in the story. Returning to the concept of cop and triad XP, we have a third levelling system. Face. This increases as Wei's status builds by helping either fellow triad members or those involved in their protection racket. In the first hours of gameplay, Wei can only afford the cheap knockoff clothes and jewellery from the night market. Even if he could afford luxury products, items are gated behind a certain face level. It's a somewhat clunky implementation, because there's no justifiable reason a clothes store would refuse a sale just because you're not a big name triad gangster. Maybe this was done because rocking down to a cheap North Point apartment in a Lambo would blow your cover, but the game never suggests this. The gamey nature of this system makes me think it wasn't a narrative choice. The problem could have been addressed by working in the opposite direction, where a high face level would introduce severe discounts to bring items down to an affordable price. Regardless, it serves its core function well. Wei starts as a low level gangster driving cheap smart cars and becomes an influential triad elite, coasting through the city 
property in his supercar. This is mirrored by property ownership. He receives new houses around the city following certain significant story beats, and those often involve someone higher up the food chain getting arrested or killed. His status as a Tryon member comes at a high cost, and despite that, the fancy mansions and apartments don't seem to make a difference to him. Properties are limited in use, and very little time will be spent here, and despite the newer luxurious beds, Wei is still haunted by the same nightmares he experienced in his original run-down flat. One of the major themes in Sleeping Dogs is the relationship between status and identity. Driving around Hong Kong, it's hard not to notice the prevalent advertising. Wall-to-wall -wall billboards dress the city in a bright glow, and radio adverts might suggest that a certain item of clothing will help you show off the real you. Of course, this is very likely coincidental, a consequence of trying to accurately recreate the feel of Hong Kong in all aspects. But regardless of intention, the world still delivers the illusion that bolstering your status can help reinforce your identity. This is in strong contrast to the methods of progression, all of which require helping people, building trust with triad allies, or enforcing justice and a sense of what's right. Health is improved with meditation shrines dotted around the map. Some progression elements are tied to Wei's relationship with girls, and learning new fighting moves has him returning to his old Sifu, who imparts in him wisdom surrounding Wei's strange return to Hong Kong. This all reinforces the concept that status can be artificial, a means to avoid true self-discovery by surrounding yourself with distractions that reinforce that fake confidence that needs to be upheld. This is particularly relevant to Wei, who has built friendships and trust off of deceit and ulterior motives as an undercover officer. In my opinion, the core underlying theme of Sleeping Dogs is that your identity is created by those you surround yourself with. It's found with the initially threatening triad members who become Wei's friends, or in the rich culture of the city that he's re-immersed himself in, the unlikely allies in the police force, and the relationships that emphasize Wei's weaknesses and insecurities. Hey, Ricky. Walk easy, walk, walk. We have to talk. I got nothing to say to you. Calm down, okay? Listen, Big Smiley's coming after anyone who's a threat. I work for Sonny Wo. We're Lee's biggest backers, and unlike you, I'm loyal to my friends. Sonny told me about you and Vivian. What? Ricky, I didn't do anything. I swear it. But... Sonny recorded a video of us together to blackmail me, and now the police have it. They're threatening to release it if I don't testify against Sonny. What do you think Lee will do to her when he hears? You said no? Of all the people Sonny told me to be with, Wei is the only one who said no. The only one! Uncle Po prioritizes the value in family, and that influence is felt even beyond his death. Big Smile Lee is ultimately brought down by an undercover cop, but a cop who still felt allegiance to his Water Street gang. A cop who defended them with Winston's golden gun. A cop who worked with Triad members to defend their values of trust and security. The game makes it clear that these people are not good guys. They commit heinous crimes and bring ruin and death to those who cross them. It also makes it clear that these traits aren't exclusive to the triads. Pendru is guilty of just as much. In the end, Broken Nose Zhang truly walks the grey area to show her loyalty by offering Wei a final piece of justice. A video incriminating Pendru for cooperating with Uncle Po in the past, and later killing him in his hospital bed. And that's why it's perfect that Wei never really comes to a true conclusion by the end of the game. Of course, this was very likely sequel baiting, but leaving his identity uncertain demonstrates that finding yourself isn't an easily solvable problem. It's one that takes time and consideration. Wei's return to Hong Kong is enlightening, his morals are challenged, and his view of the triads fundamentally changes. He's betrayed and faced with loss even as he builds new meaningful bonds and rekindles old ones. This this is all while establishing a reputation that is ultimately fake, one that you'll have to drop by the time the credits roll. 
Hong Kong is not just a region or city, it's a culture, and one deeply influenced by its history both as a Chinese region and a British colony. While the future of Hong Kong is more uncertain than ever, there's a prevailing belief among many of its residents that despite everything, they are Hong Kongers. Not entirely Chinese, not entirely British. The influences from outside those streets cannot be changed or forgotten because they're embedded deep within Hong Kong culture, and changes in the future will similarly alter what being a Hong Konger is, but never what it means. Wei's story ends on an open note not for lack of a neat bow to tie it with, but because the way you define yourself must change over time, no matter how uncertain you may be about it in the present. That's why I love Sleeping Dogs, because when you return home and experience that strange disconnect that time brings, it helps you realise that there's more to a home than the walls around it. You return for your family, family by blood or otherwise, the people who will continue to influence you going into the future.